My job is to do uh, something of a framing for, for the more detailed work in the, in the rest of the day. And, uh, and I do that by focusing on the, on the work that Soldru has done at the broader level. Um, I start with an initial focus on, on money metric inequality. Um, that sounds smarter than income, right? Income gets disparaged too quickly. Uh, and, we, and in truth, we have done a lot of work on, on um, income and expenditures and even on wealth, as I'll come back to uh, just now. But so he has a picture that comes out of a, a report that's been pretty influential in this country that uh, Solru produced for the OECD in 2010, 2011 actually. And it really was just to, to describe, to profile what we knew about poverty and inequality and, and the labor market and the connection between the labor market and poverty and inequality. Uh, it has to service a few purposes in this presentation. One, you'll notice the dates of the different time periods. Okay, it's a picture of the South African income distribution from survey data that's, that you need the survey data to derive these pictures. And uh, perhaps Soldier's defining uh, investment in itself in the, in the country has been to produce these sorts of data for the country. So 1993 was the, what I call the Soldru survey, the, the, the World Bank um, Soldru PSLSD survey that was uh, commissioned or requested by the incoming ANC so that they had an evidence base on which to, to move forward in building the country. So, uh, and then the, the, uh, the, the, two, the, the 2000 data is Statistics South Africa and reflects the fact that we've always had a, a virtuous relationship with StatsSA um, we see part of our role as being super good at analyzing these surveys to maximum effect and, uh, and it's a partnership in a sense with Stats to Say. Um, 2010 is the National Income Dynamic Study, which is South Africa's national panel study um, that uh, Soldru has been running on behalf of the presidency and now the DPME since its inception in 2008. And so I won't come back to this again today, but it's worth recording the huge investment of Soldru in gathering these surveys and um, in cleaning the data, in focusing on, on data quality, in being insistent that in South Africa we need uh, reliable evidence on which to inform our, our policies and our view of ourselves and our progress as a society. And uh, we, we've had, uh, we've invested heavily in training, training the nation if you like. We've had a, an ongoing summer school that's been running since 1999. Every year it's been training around about 80 South Africans with a sort of a strong non-UCT rule not UCT South Africans, uh, civil society, uh, graduate students and junior faculty from historically disadvantaged universities. And so there's that huge investment that we've made and, uh, and we're, we're proud of and, we, and that's still what we do to a large extent. Uh, we'll get quite quickly to the, the panel data because that's our current uh, really special contribution, I think, in the South African milieu. Three, two thousand, two thousand and eight, but it's a slide that goes to the type of descriptive contribution that we've been making in the country around poverty and inequality. You know, uh, who are the poor? Uh, what is the texture of our inequality? And I, the reason I present this particular slide, which is, what is it exactly? It just presents the, the distribution of 
of South Africans from the poorest 10%, that's one, to the richest 10%, that's 10. And then the bar graphs tell you which share of the national income they, they actually have or get. And so you can see that the, the, the lowest 10%, the poorest 10% of South Africans get way under 1% of the, of the income, whereas the top end gets, you know, uh, it's risen from 54 to 58% over time. So this is uh, let me, a, a little anecdote. At one point, Trevor Manuel said to me, you know, Soldo really doesn't work hard enough to be impactful. And he whips this graph out of his briefcase. And he says, look at this graph. This is an impactful graph. And it was this one, <laughs> so, so, which Soldo produced, right? So perhaps we've got a communication problem. <laughs> But that's not the same sort of problem. Anyway, it was a rather lovely moment. I can't tell you how much I enjoyed it. <laughs> uh, and this, I mean, this graph, w people have built on this. There's been some, some uh, influential work by uh, Ingrid Willard and Alan Hirsch and uh, Brian Levy that has then split the top 10% to show some important things, that actually even the top 10% is a bit too broad. Because what's really happened in South Africa is the top 5% or even the top 1% have flourished. But uh, that hasn't been spread. So, the, you know, the, people are very focused on top incomes at the moment. And, uh, and this, sorts of, this sort of work has been leading the day. I'll give you a, a graph just to, to nail the point. This is a picture out of uh, Tom Fekete's book. Um, and uh, and the reds are the South African. Make it the full. Thanks, Cal. Thank you. Thanks. Better. Can you hear me at least, even if you can't see? Okay. Cool. So this is the top ten percent shares in in a few countries that Piketty chose to profile. And then the red is the South African uh, work where the data comes out of a combination of, of, uh, of national accounts and Stats data and some of the Soldru data sets. But you can see that our top 10% is something of an outlier even on the world uh, stage. And then the work on the 1%, et cetera, uh, becomes super important. The, just quickly, uh, this then is the top 1%. And so this is more a point uh, about, Piketty uses this in a sense, to make the point that, um, not that the South African top 1% incomes are super bad, but he's trying to show what happens in the US, actually, that they go towards the South African top 1%, even if the top 10% is way lower. So he's making the point about how, how much of an outlier the top 1% is in, in the US. Another uh, influential area of work of soldiers in the sort of cross-sectional profiling of data is uh, this breakdown of um, income sources. So you've got labor market income or remittance income or uh, government, that's our social grants, or capital income. Um, and uh, this graph simply profiles uh, the how South Africans are getting by in a, in a fashion because you've got the poorest 10% right at the bottom and it tells you in 1993 how important remittances were. That's our history. That's Francis Wilson's history. That's migrant labor at work. Uh, and the fairly small percentage of, of government cr cash transfers um, and uh, the labor market making less of a contribution than it should. And anyway, I just let the visuals tell the story. You can see the labor the post-apartheid labor market not functioning to the benefit of South Africans. You can see right at the bottom end, there's even less South Africans deriving support out of the labor market. Um, you can see it's a defining characteristic of, of being better off 
a high labor market share. You can see a stunning uh, growth in the contribution of government transfers. And you can see a declining, a decline in remittances, which is the sort of private social safety net, if you like, in our society. Also an important graph that's, uh, I'm not sure it's actually in the, in the National Development Plan, but it was in the documents. And, uh, and Solder has done a lot of technical work around this to try and push a bit further than those descriptives. Uh, we decompose things a lot. It's a technical expression. It just means breaking them down. But in, uh, um, it sounds a bit like death, but it's not. Um, so th in this case, the decomposition is to show you of those income sources, what's the contribution to inequality? And it's quite technical work, and it's the type of work that we've been pursuing as our contribution in the country. So a big picture finding that comes out of this is that 0.6 out of the point out of a Gini coefficient, that's 0 0.66, 0 0.6 of that is due to wage income. And we've done some more technical work, even made some initial uh, innovative contributions to the international literature to show that. Some of that's the, the, uh, the zero earnings. It's not quite 50-50, but 45% of that or so is the unemployment issue, the no, the no earnings issue. And then a big part also is the inequality of earnings themselves. And we've backed this up with a huge amount of work on, on earnings inequality itself and the earnings distribution and the quality of the earnings data and understanding what's driven the earnings distribution in the country. We've uh, also, particularly through Ingrid Willard, and pity she can't be here right now as well, um, but uh, taken this work into closer to policy. These, the, uh, the type of exercises that I'm presenting before you here look at uh, how the distribution of income in South Africa changes as you as you take as you start with market income that's what you earn in the labor market then you add uh, then you take away taxes you ta you tax people and you see what does that distribution look like then you add the social grants and the free basic services and then uh, you add some more of the government contribution through VAT uh, fuel and other taxes and then you add education and health expenditures to to the picture and it's very very uh, careful nitpicky type work that requires that you combine the household surveys that we produce with administrative data out of government departments uh, to show for example to get this final picture here and you can see that that the education and health expenditures are strongly redistributive, right? You can see that in the potential decline in the, in the Gini coefficient. Um, and so uh, you, that requires that you work with government departments and work out the average spending per learner in rural Eastern Cape, and then you can twin it to your surveys, and then you can get a figure like that. Uh, I think two things are relevant about the slide. Well, one is that, that it's a huge investment of, of work, but also to recognize what Soldier doesn't do, because this is the potential of the budget. It's not necessarily the realized potential of the budget, right? It's, we've got a very well-designed budget. That doesn't mean it actually lowers inequality. We know it doesn't lower inequality. So there's a big conundrum. And some of our work gets stuck in and unpacks what really goes on in the education system or health system. Uh, but, uh, you know, not all of our work picks up on, like delivery, for example. We don't do government public administration and delivery, and it sits as a huge issue between this and, and getting better, uh, better off in our society. Okay. Uh, Ingrid Willard says, has been working on the Davis Committee and we've tried to support that work in, in general in the unit. That's why I can talk about it this morning. It's not just about Ingrid, it's about all of us. To, uh, to get together the data that the Davis Committee needed to start looking at its, um, 
to start making some findings to, to try and be supportive in any way we could with the evidence base uh, for the committee. And, uh, and so in that regard, um, working with the National Treasury, we've, we've tried to open up the issue of the, the uh, personal income tax data and the wealth distribution, which are absolutely fundamental. At the same time, we've been gathering information in the National Income Dynamics Study on wealth. And so the Davis Committee recently re released a report on wealth, and hopefully it's better off for all of these efforts um, on, the, on that very tricky issue. Okay, but a focus on income is very limiting. And we, we know that because Soldier has always worked at the same time, well, s since our post-Soldier um, post 30 experience, we've been working in many, many dimensions. And even the, the Soldier 1993 survey was a very general purpose survey. And, um, and so we've been working in many other dimensions other than income. And so this is a graph from Stats SA on, on multi what's called multidimensional poverty, and it uh, features health, education, living standards, and economic activity. Um, so Soldier used NIDS data to actually pilot some of this work on multidimensional poverty. And if you go back to the Stats SA reports, um, you'll find uh, one of the reports, they actually benchmark their work against a Soldru MPI line. So the implication is, which I don't think is warranted, but it's nice for an occasion like today, that we're checking our results by showing you that they're pretty close to the Soldru multidimensional poverty line. Uh, it's actually not the right thing to do because their data was, uh, they had much, many more data points to use. But So we've been very active, but not just in profiling multidimensional poverty. Obviously, uh, the ball game in this country is that South Africans haven't got better off over the post-apartheid period. Multidimensionally, in terms of access to services and things, we've made quite a lot of progress. The big question is how come the progress on social grants and the progress on basic services and things hasn't generated a different society, a more vibrant uh, society where people are getting ahead. And to some extent, a large chunk of our work is really directed at that, that uh, dynamic question. But uh, along the way, uh, Martin's here this morning, we've also pushed this asset uh, multidimensional profiling into the inequality space. It's not an easy thing to do. It's, it's not a trivial exercise to actually take your assets. And, and if you're going to talk about wealth in a country like South Africa, these assets are also important to, to everyday South Africans. Um, so this graph really just flags the fact that, uh, that we've done some pioneering work, largely, uh, you know, through Martin on how do you do this? How do you appropriately measure asset inequality? And uh, at pioneering in an international sense, we solved some problems that were unsolved because they need to be solved. That's the key point, I guess. Okay, so I made the point about multi, about our income contribution, the importance of the labor market, uh, but we also in a society where there's education and health and there's, and there's a life course of South Africans and so uh, our panel work has, has been important, I think super important, in actually convincing South Africans that, um, that by and large, we aren't actually on a positive trajectory for many, many South Africans. You need a panel study, you need to follow people over time so that you're telling the st their story of their changes. It's not the unemployment rate or the poverty level, it's, uh, 28,000 in the case of NIDS, South Africans who, who every second year tell their story and they give us a picture like this of income mobility. So I'm back at income, but not, but not so, not apologetically anymore because at the end of the day, all these assets are supposed to equip South Africans to get a job and to get a productive job and to earn income. So there's a very complicated relationship between income and all the other 
and wealth and assets. That's at the very heart of the contemporary inequality discussion. So this is a devastating graph out of NIDS. I think it's devastating anyway, in the sense that 29% of uh, South Africans are that little cell up at the top, 28.7, I'm taking some poetic license, uh, are in severe poverty. That's below half of the poverty line in 2008 and, and still there in 2014. So they're stuck. They're in a poverty trap. And we've done quite a lot of work, which I'll show some of it just now, um, about, well, why? What's driving that? That's 30% of our country, right? Or below half of the poverty line. And then there's notionally some mobility around, around the middle of the distribution. And then there's a non-poor section of, of a non-poor, non-poor. And that's a very blunt category, right? That's not the top 10% of the income distribution. It's just above the poverty line. And there's a, a, a group of 21% who are pretty st stably there. Uh, they're not poor in 2008. They're not poor again in 2014 and for the rest of the the distribution there's quite a lot of volatility and we've done quite a lot of work to try and tease out this story um, using the panel to in 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 the richness that it can be used so income class schema maybe class class is this very sensitive word I'm not always sure it's we buy more trouble than we we gain by using that word but um, if you think about the society uh, feeding off, off work that's been done on vulnerability uh, as the poor, the middle class somehow, uh, and the elite, okay? Uh, the the, the uh, panel study, the panel dynamics work in, mid, in NIDS have done a pretty good job of showing actually that, that that's not a very good characterization of South Africa. A better characterization is that we've got this group that are stuck in poverty. They're the chronically poor. Then we've got a transitarily poor who you might pick up as below the poverty line this, this time, but they'll be above the poverty line the next time. Then you've got a vulnerable group who are above the poverty line this time, but they may as well, they'll be below the poverty line next time. And then if you think about the middle class, one plausible definition is a class of people who, who don't have to look over their shoulders at the dangers of falling back into poverty. So they can make decisions that are forward looking, they can invest in the education of their children, they can take out a bond on a house, etc. So in other words, a low probability of falling into poverty is some definition of the middle class. Then, then they come in there and then an elite who the vulnerability of falling into poverty is not even in their decision set any minute of any day. Uh, so the, the, uh, you require a panel study to tease out this work. And this is what uh, Soldier has done recently, and this is what we find. We find that 50% uh, of South Africans are chronically poor. 11% 11, and this is in 2014. 11% uh, uh, are, are this transient poor, 15% are the vulnerable in the sense they're above the line now, but they, they can be and have high probabilities of falling back into poverty. This middle class is, is about 20%, which is way lower than the burgeoning black diamonds and the other narratives that we have about our society. It doesn't seem to be borne out in the livelihood dynamics of NIDS. And then the elite is about 4%. So about 24 to two, about a quarter of South Africans are middle class or more. And you can see the racial breakdowns there. They've been, there's been some progress, um, but obviously the top end is still way disproportionately white. Uh, we've done some, then some modeling of, okay, what determines these drivers? How am I doing for time, Fazila? Okay. I need to, yeah, okay. So a few key points that come out. So what's been driving these transitions or the lack of transitions? 
One key point that we've been surfacing and then done a lot of really excellent work on is the fact that demography is hugely important. South African households are unstable, people move, um, they, they have combined themselves with different households, etc. Uh, a lot of, some of, if you think about income per capita or some measure like that, the per capita bit is demography, the income bit is income, and the demography is hugely important. The income's also important. Um, I don't want to dwell too much on that. Let me rather surface the type of results that we found from this modeling through a few pictures. So remember the middle class category, that's about 20% of South Africans. One way of, of characterizing, okay, what, what's the average middle class person look like? They're in a male-headed household, African, 45 years old, 12 years of schooling, so complete matric, works, but works in a white-collar job. That turns out to be incredibly important. What's their household look like? Not too many children, one child, uh, no adults greater than 60 plus. So the pension really kicks at the lower part of the distribution rather than here, lives in urban Gauteng. Okay, so that's just a profiling that comes out of all of these models that we we build. What's interesting about it is, okay, so how does that change when you drift down to being a vulnerable in the vulnerable category? The key points there are you're, you're likely to be in a female-headed household. So the gender issues come out hugely and the more we probe them on, on NIDS, the more important they are. You, uh, you won't have complete matric. And your, your access to the labor market, generally you're not economically active. Uh, but one other member is employed. Do you see? Uh, that's a very important rider. That should be bolder too. So the head is not economically active, but one other member is employed. You're definitely not just vulnerable if you've got no employed members in your household. You're in big trouble. But having one member employed is not guaranteed to actually boost you out of poverty. It puts you in that precarious situation. Okay, then shifting to the elite. There's a change of complexion of the little guy. Um, 48 years old, 14 years of schooling. So some, some uh, tertiary schooling. Uh, no children living in the household and the head is white. So that's just a profiling of the type of uh, work. Um, one, we've then dived into the labor market dynamics that undergird this in quite, quite some detail. And it makes that point that unemployment is a, is a huge problem, actually. This graph serves to make, unemployment is a huge problem, but this discussion of the quality of employment is not a theoretical or a nice to have or a whatever. It's hugely important because it goes to being a productive citizen in society. It goes to moving ahead. Uh, it's very, very important. Um, and it, it's, so the managers, professionals, and technicians are almost exclusively uh, the, the preserve of the middle class and the elite. Um, whereas some of the, the more basic occupations can be spread across the distribution because they, they don't actually make the definitive difference. They, it's not that they're unimportant. It's just that they don't make the definitive difference. Okay, so this is just a nightmare slide just to see if you're still in, are you still in there with me? Because uh, this is what's going on behind the scenes of those cute little pictures. Because you need to be modeling these poverty transitions. So in this case, you were initially poor, then, then the next wave of NIDS, you're not. You are or you're not, and then you follow people, and so you go. And the reason I wanted this slide in, in here is that if you're going to collect panel data or household survey data in the country, you also have an obligation, and it's something that soldiers embraced, to, to use it to world-class standards, to make sure that these data that you collect, which are super expensive, but super valuable, potentially, if they're going to be valuable, you've got to actually analyze them. And I think soldiers' unique contribution, especially the young Turks around, has been to, to, to grab that mantle 
from Professor Wilson from the 1993 survey and build on it and really run with it. And so the, the dynamics of inequality are super hard. They are very, very hard. And everybody loves to talk about Piketty and they love to talk about the importance of wealth and they loved. It is very hard to use these, to, to actually gather those data, to use them appropriately. And that's, that's our space. That's what we love doing. We think we do it very well. And um, yeah, that's why I gave you the spaghetti graph. Uh, I won't have time to play this because I'm going to squeeze out to other people. But the reason why I had the slide in here is because um, it's, it's a recording, it's a note that uh, Dumisa and Sabeza took when he was working in the TRC. And it's a guy in Grahamstown talking about reconciliation. And he says, um, he says, I completely understand. I'm a member of the ANC. I'm a loyal member of the ANC. I was in prison for the ANC. I fought for liberation. I'm now out of prison. And he's talking about Nelson Mandela. And he says, uh, so is Nelson Mandela. He's also out of prison. But he found a way. He found a job. He's got a good job. He can make his contribution. I also want to make my contribution, says this guy in Grahamstown. I also want to make my contribution. I haven't been able to find a job. So, and this is like 1997, 98, somewhere around there, right? So he says, well, I can completely understand why th about reconciliation and the ANC pushing for reconciliation. It's not, it's not something that like, is easy. I don't buy it because it's, I'm me and I'm sitting in a shack in Grahamstown and then the, the guys that actually put me in jail in Grahamstown have done super well in the post-apartheid society. So all, the point is that these dynamics that I've been telling you about, about the middle class and blah, 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 they've had amazing resonance with ordinary South Africans. When we talk about them out there, it provides a platform even for people to say, yes, okay, I got ahead and it completely uh, meshes with what you're saying. It's not just a sort of a bashing government. It just seems to resonate. But the going is hard. I got ahead, but the going is hard. You're telling a story that needs to be told. Uh, Patricia is going to pick up on, there's another lens on all of this, which is the intergenerational lens. So that old guy in Grahamstown in the late uh, 1990s is telling us that the society has failed him. The youth of today are telling us pretty much the same thing. And Solder has done a lot of work on intergenerational failure, which is a different lens on all of this, right? It's, it's the fact that every South African parent hoped for a better future for their kids. And uh, so that's a teaser or a bridge into Patricio's session. This is a damning indictment uh, from the NIDS data recently that shows that uh, if, you, if you are a parent working in the bottom 5% of the earnings distribution, right? This is about the labor market. Your kids have, more, have a 90 to 95% chance of being in the same part of the distribution. So in other words, no intergenerational success at that level. These are super high figures. Uh, I'll leave you, you can come back to this. Patricia can give you some more. Thank you.